So today we're going to take a look at our seven frame hive. It's, we've had a lot of questions coming in and it's been very popular in the northern hemisphere with the, um, the springtime blooming there and well just about to and also um, up into the so USA and, and Canada where the seven frame size or the ten frame Langstroth is, is a very popular size. So I might just um, answer a few questions to clarify about that. If you've got questions, put them in the comments below and we'll answer them while we're on the call. So um, just to clarify a little bit, a, a seven frame flow hive is the same size as a 10 frame Langstroth, more or less. The boxes do vary a bit, but uh, the 10 frame size brood box fits 10 brood frames and that's why it gets called a 10 frame. And that's a popular size here in Australia, it's popular in New Zealand, it's popular in the USA and in Canada. So it's um, a very common size you'll see around and a lot of beekeepers want that bigger sizing. So we've, we've responded to, um, to what people want and made our Flow Hive 2 with all of the features now in the, um, the larger size, which is the 10 frame Langstroth, or we call it a seven frame Flow Hive because the frames are a little bit wider in the uh, super that's what gets called a seven frame and the reason why they're wider is bees like to store honey in the cells you can see here and they like to store honey deeper than they do brood so it's a, it's a beautiful thing you can see a hive a, f a frame here we harvested in the in the rain last week on the veranda we actually lifted up this hive and put it on the veranda it was quite funny um, and here's, here's a frame here that's very full. You can see the capping all the way down the edge. So uh, if you've got questions, put them in the comments below and we'll answer them. If you take a look um, around here, you'll see that um, the side window is capped and the bees are getting even a little bit carried away and starting to attempt to put even more comb on top. So um, that's good to see. Although, there's not that much of a flow on right now. The rains have just come, so we should expect some things like the Melaleuca to respond to that and start blooming. But right now, it's um, a time with not a whole lot of flow, even though you see all of these beautiful flowers we've planted in the garden uh, are all blooming. The general forage around is um, not in a big flow at the moment. So any questions, put them in the comments below. We may as well, um, harvest a little bit of honey because that's fun while we're answering questions. If you've got these shelf brackets and these come with the hive with our limited launch special we've got the um, the harvesting shelf, the veil and the adjustable stand all come with the hive at the moment so if you're interested in those extra things now could be a, a great time to take advantage of that. So I've just connected on my jar shelf and the window that we pulled from here becomes the shelf there. So the next thing we're going to do is pull out a cap. Now if the cap's a little tight you can use the end of the tube here just to flick it out like that. So, so Peter, does this hive come with the same adjustable legs as the other flow hive too? It does. So. So at the moment we're throwing that in for free, so if you want to take advantage of that, please um, please do. The adjustable stand here, you can see the feet, you can adjust it on each corner and there's a level built in on the side and at the back here, if you can see under there, which just helps you set your level if you're drawing natural comb as well as um, the, the, the forward backwards tilt for the perfect honey harvesting angle. So those features uh, something we wanted to build in just to help people to make sure they get it right when they're harvesting. And this hive is made from Aracaria wood. What is Aracaria? So Aracaria is this beautiful wood you see here. It's, it's a uh, Australian native cabinet timber. Some people call it hoop pine but it's not really like pine at all. It's much more dense and it's a, it's a much more superior wood than pine. Beekeepers have a, a, a tradition of choosing 
um, Aracaria wood as the premium grade wood here in Australia. So we wanted to make it a premium quality hive and that's why we've chosen the Aracaria wood as well as being sustainably grown here locally. And what's the best way to seal Aracaria? So this here is actually a, um, it's actually advertised as an anti-mould linseed. We get that from Bunnings here in Australia. But if you're wanting wood to stay looking nice and beautiful like wood outdoors, then you will need to put something on it which helps protect it. Now, it's always a bit of a battle because it'll want to naturally grey or mildew over time. I'm just going to turn the key here while we're talking and shortly we'll start to see the honey flowing out. So if you, if you are looking around at stains, choose something that you can put on the outside of the box that's going to last. I would steer away from, from um, all natural tongue oil on, on this finish because it tends to um, pick up the mildew quite quickly. So, um, or else you can paint it like this hive here. You can see this um, beautiful paint job on this hive. So a good outdoor paint is also a great option and it's, and it's a, a fun thing to, to do your own design, get your family involved on your hive. Or well, you can do a bit of both. You can start off with natural wood and if, if, if it's proving too hard to um, keep coating it, and keep it looking like that, you can revert to just giving it a coat. You can actually paint it with the bees in it. You can see that beautiful honey pouring out of the hive now. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the handle on the rest of this frame. It's a, um, it's a nice dark honey, look at that. There's a few people in our office which love their dark honey, so they'll be happy to see this honey pouring out of the hive. It's beautiful, look at that streaming in. I'll, I never get sick of watching honey pour out of the hive and it's, it's um, often the thing people speak about. They say, well, I've seen all the videos, but to actually see it in person watching the honey flow out is something else. It's somehow surreal. It's like, hang on a minute, you just turned the handle and the honey came out. And I never get sick of, sick of watching that. Craig's asking if we have any um, specialised products to winterise boxes. Okay, so we um, we're you're probably referring to an insulation wrap on a hive. We don't have anything like that at the moment. Some people do wrap their hives, and some people don't. And there's kind of a varied opinion on whether you should or you shouldn't. So um, do your research on that one. But um, you will see some examples online. Of, of how people do prepare their hives for winter if they do want to insulate. When you seal your hive, is there any need to seal the inside of the hive? Generally what I do is keep the inside perfectly natural for the bees. The bees, they keep it, they keep it nice inside. There's no need to, to protect it, I don't think. However, conventionally, beekeepers do paint the inside of the box to, to try and make the boxes last as long as possible and they'll dip them in all sorts of chemicals and everything so if you do want to paint the inside of the box your bees will still be fine there's a long tradition of that which is that I prefer to keep it natural for the bees. What are the benefits of having the seven frame over a six frame? So the, uh, the main benefit is the hive is bigger so you get two more brood frames in here, which is more space for the bees to lay brood and expand their colony. You get another frame in here, which is another three kilograms or another full jar of honey when you are harvesting. So, but the, um, the key benefits are matching what's going on in your area. So, so it's quite popular in the USA. It's quite popular in Canada especially in the colder regions where, where um, a bigger hive can sometimes be the difference between your colony lasting over winter. So, so for those reasons, you'll often get the advice that the bigger hive is the one to get. And we're seeing that it's, um, it is popular in Canada, it is popular 
the USA. It's also popular in the southern parts here in Australia. Having said that, um, 10 frame around here is a popular choice as well. Um, you see commercial beekeepers will often have a mix of eights and tens. I say eights and tens, that's the that's the Langstroth brood box, a little bit confusing. We've gone and added seven flow frames to the 10 size or six flow frames to the eight size. We had to do a bit of maths early on to work out a dimension that would work nicely across the two box sizes. Irene's asking, will this wood last through Canadian winters? So absolutely, there, there's, um, there's no reason why this wood wouldn't last in the, in the harsh cold winters. It's a um, very robust wood. It's A grade Aracaria. There is no knots or anything to, um, to move or, or let water in. So um, it's, a, uh, it's a nice choice having the, the bigger size hive and the Aracaria in those colder regions. Matt's in the Blue Mountains and wants to know if you think it's too late to split a hive now. Okay, Blue Mountains, you do have some cold weather coming up, even some a little bit of snow, I believe. Um, however, not as cold as, as um, some areas. Um, look, it depends a little bit. In autumn, if you do get a long cold winter, it depends really how late your flowers go. If, it, if there's another few months of flowers to come, then it could be quite okay to do a split. But the best information you're going to get for that is from your local beekeepers so so ask around and and see what they say Dan's asking what filters the honey on the way out so nothing filters the honey on the way out and that was a real win we we um, spent a decade developing the flow frames my father and I and the the aim of the game was to get the honey out of the hive without having to s disturb the bees in a, in a gentle way where the bees don't really even notice you're harvesting the honey and we achieve that but what we also achieved is we don't need to go through that filtration process so all of the wax stays in the hive and the bees then recycle that which is a bit of a savings for the bees effort because it takes seven kilograms of honey to produce a kilogram of wax now having said that you sometimes get the tiniest little flecks which are the um, joins between the cell walls where uh, we left a gap so that the bees um, legs or wings wouldn't get caught if bees happen to be down the cells when the um, movement happened to create the channels inside the comb so sometimes you get the tiniest little flex it's not a problem even to jar that up for the table they're so small it doesn't matter but as you can see here it's just coming out perfectly clear and and most of the time it does except for if you've um, got um, a, an issue where uh, there's a bit of build up of debris in the trough area, then you'll get that coming out and floating to the top of the honey. But even that's not an issue. So I never filter my honey and I never have to. And I'm so glad because I used to spend a long time settling and filtering honey in the conventional way, conventional way when I was selling honey to the local shops. Jenny's asking if there's a hard and fast rule as to how far apart each hive should be. She's got four hives at present and has just ordered another two. There isn't a hard and fast rule. There's no reason why you can't put them right up against each other, or practically right up against each other. With um, Flow Hive has its benefit of um, opening the window, so you wanna leave enough space so that you can look in the side windows and get that extra view into how the bees are going. Um, commercial operations often put four on a pallet, just um, all jammed together, so there's no problem putting them together and it's equally no problem of, of um, spanning them out. Um, Chance says he runs a nine frame brood chamber. Okay, fantastic. Nine frame brood chamber isn't a bad idea. If you shave the edge of your frames down, you can fit one more frame in the box. And for naturally drawn comb, that's not a bad idea because the B space, it becomes more correct for drawing comb. The 35 millimeter uh, combs that we, we currently or use are actually somewhere in between what they want to use for honey and what they want to use for brood. So running a nine frame is a, is a great idea. 
because um, you'll see when the bees draw their, their comb it'll be a little bit straighter because it's sitting right on where they like to draw the comb which is more like a 32 millimeter um, spacing between comb guides. So that would fit a six frame super on top? Um, that what he's referring to would probably be a putting nine frames in it in a um, uh, you're right thanks Leah <laughs> you totally uh, totally got got me there um, so um, that would be in the six frame box sorry which is our eight frame box here you can put a ninth frame in in this one it would actually be 11 now beekeepers often go the other way in honey and they'll put nine frames in a 10 frame box and I used to do that a lot as well when I was harvesting honey in the conventional way just because the bees will then build out comb um, a bit further and you get a little bit more honey per box and one less frame to nail together and spin and so on so so there's a few th confusing things there one is beekeepers often run nine frames in a 10 frame honey super and uh, just to to give the bees a bit more space to draw honey a bit like we've done here by by making our flow frames a little bit bigger we're allowing the bees to store more honey in each frame and also um, another concept is running um, an extra frame in your brood box um, which is something fun to experiment with as well John's in Las Vegas, Nevada. He says the summer is very hot and the winter can be really cold. Will the hive do okay there? It will. Bees are incredibly um, amazing at adapting to the climate. They've come from cold climate origins, and but yet they also do well in really hot areas. So we have people keeping bees in, in up north in Canada, we have people keeping bees in Norway with, with our flow hives. And there is no reason, it's just like any other hive. Um, you do have to do your, your winter pre preparation that's right for your area. So for instance, you might need to take out the queen excluder over winter. You might want to remove the supers altogether. And you also need to make sure there's enough forage to last the winter, which is the big thing. And it's always a bit touch and go in, the, in really cold areas, getting your hives through the winter. Chuck would like to know, should you paint the parts before you assemble the boxes? Okay, good question. So if you're painting a hive like this and you're painting um, uh, a, an outdoor house paint, you do have to bear in mind that um, we have some nice fine tolerances with our laser cuts and adding paint to them might make it hard to put them together. So if you're going to paint inside the finger joints, then you want to put them together when they're wet, which is a, a messy process, but beekeepers do often do that. If they're painting, they'll paint and then whack them together. Paint splatters everywhere. Um, it's not ideal. I tend to just paint afterwards. I, I put it all together, then put the coat of paint on the outside if I plan to paint. Juan is wondering, do you plan to manufacture any feeders to fit under the flow hive two top? Okay, that's a great question and thank you for asking because it is on my list. There is, um, there is a demand and we don't have to feed in this area because we have enough flowers or, uh, in this subtropical region, but many regions do need to feed and there, there is feeders you can put under the lid of the hive and I will, I will um, be uh, making one that fits under the hive in the not too distant future. But if you need to get started to feed your bees, then there's also all sorts of feeders you can make yourself. A simple one is a jar feeder, where you put holes in, in the lid of the jar and you place that over the hole in the inner cover. If you, um, I think these roof locks are, are on, but basically um, there's all sorts of simple feeders you, you can make. But here you can see there's a plug in, in the top. Now that plug comes out and exposes a hole 
and a, a lid with holes in it will go there. So what you basically do is, is um, fill up your jar with the, the appropriate solution depending on, on what you um, want to do. So uh, if you're wanting to stimulate lots of, lots of babies and growth in the brood box then you will do a, a lighter nectary type um, solution and um, but there's also reasons to do a thicker one if you're trying to get them to store and build up stores for, for a coming winter for instance. So you get your jar with your holes in the lid full of your syrup and you basically just turn it over and the airlock stops it from pouring out and you place that over the hole and the bees can then lick through the little holes and suck out the liquid. If you do that you'll need a spare brood box to stick on top to cover that so the sun doesn't shine on the jar and then the lid can go on top of that box. But there's also uh, more simple ones you can make. You can get a Ziploc bag fill it full of solution and put pinholes or little um, slashes in it, place that on top of the inner cover and pull the plug out, the bees will get up there and suck that um, feed out of the bag as well. Um, people also make ones that clip onto the entrance and um, other people feed, feed dry sugar by um, pouring it into, into empty honey frames. There's all sorts of things you can do for feeding. Peter's asking, is it okay to take a full flow frame from one hive and put it into another super where the bees aren't doing as well? Absolutely. You do have to bear in mind that when you move equipment from one hive to another, you are moving any pathogens from that hive to the next. So if you're prepared to take that risk, then you can move the frames. Now the, the flow hive has um, changed the game a little bit in that it, all the equipment can just stay here. It's not going off to the harvesting shed, getting mixed up and coming back to a different hive. So that is one advantage. However, if you do want to move a frame to another hive, it will stimulate them to work that sticky waxy frame straight away. There's other things you can do if you want to get faster action. You can just get a bit of burr comb from the box, get your hive tool and mash it in to the surface of the flow frame you won't damage it we've got a Facebook live a couple of videos back showing you just how to do that and um, the bees will then run up there and distribute it quite quickly in that area and you'll get some faster action to get going. Um, Sabine's asking how do you decide when the honey has cured and dried enough to harvest do you test the water content of the honey beforehand or do you go by what you see? So bees dewater the nectar, turn it into honey, and then finally they cap it when the water contents typically around the um, 16 to 20%. And that's because they know that the water content has to be below that in order for it to keep on the shelf. So generally if you're harvesting capped frames, then you're harvesting good honey that will keep. So most of the time you get a really good idea of that from the outside of the hive by looking in the windows. You can see the capping in here. You can see the capping on the outside. It's a good indication that most of your frame will be capped. Now, commercial beekeepers typically will take a box if it's 70% capped. So um, if, if you're um, confident that that capping is on the frames, then go ahead and harvest and that honey should keep. However, if you're, if you're unsure, you can get something that's called a refractometer where you can test um, the honey coming out. You could even just crack a few cells. The, the um, frame allows you to do that just by poking the tool in a little way, twist it, and you get some honey out and you can test the water content of that honey. Fun thing to do. Um, not that necessary because you can just see if it's capped. Um, Heather says she really loves the hives and, would, and really wants one, but has no experience keeping bees. What's the best way to get started? Yum. Okay, fantastic. More than half of our Flow Hive customers are brand new to beekeeping. And it's a really enjoyable learning curve where, where you get to learn how to look after your bees and open up that brood nest and experience the wonder of just how fast and how amazing these insects can move and work as a colony and create their comb and all the things you need to do to, to look after your bees. 
So the best thing to do is get online, have a look at our beginning beekeeping series, which will open your eyes to, to what kind of things you need to do looking after your hive. And we've got um, a wealth of, of videos to show you just how to go about doing brood inspections and so on. Um, having said that, it's also great to connect with local mentors or local cl clubs and um, get a bit of help as you get started in your beekeeping. If you can't find a mentor, sometimes it's hard, then the next best thing is to beekeep with another new beekeeper because together you can learn and share and look up things and find out what might be amiss and then you can um, ask me, I'm here every Wednesday, if you're seeing something unusual and, and uh, hopefully we can point you in the right direction. I say Wednesday but it's a big world so this time every week I should say. Chuck would like to know, when the hives are close, do you have a drifting problem? Okay, so the, the drifting so is um, what Chuck's talking about there, and it's a, it's a neat thing to talk about, is if you've got a prevailing wind, often the bees will come home, they're heavy, they can take the, almost the whole body weight in nectar, which is extraordinary, and pollen. And, um, and let's say the wind's coming from here, and, and, and they, were, they were coming for some flowers over there. They might come in, they're trying to get to their hive, they're trying to get to their hive, and then all of a sudden the wind blows them and they're like, ah, oh, I give up, this will do. Now, a neighboring hive will accept a bee if it comes laden with nectar and pollen. But if they come empty handed, no way, you kick them out. <laughs> so so um, it's a pretty good policy. Um, and, uh, but that's called drift. So. When you have hives close together, you will get drift between your hives, which could result in, um, in the passing of, um, of uh, diseases such as AFB, for instance. There's been quite a few studies on it, and some say yes and some say no, so you can do your research around that. But the, um, generally, um, bees coming back are bringing back new nectar and they've consumed everything in their honey stomach when they're out. So they're less likely to be carrying um, honey, which has um, AFB spores in it. But you know, do your research on, on that one. Um, drifting, um, if you're concerned about drifting, then I think you need to put your hive from memory 10 meters apart from the neighboring one to get no drift between the hives. Um. The way you're harvesting now, um, Barry's asking, with exposed honey, do you ever have robbing issues? Okay, that's a great question. And the answer is, yes, we do. And usually, the two, <laughs> the two reasons why you get robbing issues are the bees got really hungry, there was a lot of forage around, they were busy foraging, and then all of a sudden it turned off. And the bees are like, where is it, where is it? And they're looking everywhere, and they go, there it is, behind the hive. They come around, they find it, they go back inside the hive, do a dance, to tell the bees that it's just around the back of the hive and it's amazing they can communicate such interesting information and then you'll get a lot of bees coming to your jar. But more commonly the issue of robbing is when the bees are in a robbing mood anyway and that can happen when there's been exposed honey. So let's say uh, you've taken a few frames out of a beehive and you've put them uh, around the corner there and you have forgot about them then some hives will find, it's illegal to do that by the way, it's not good to leave exposed honey because that's where bees can take a load of honey that could contain AFB spores or EFB and, and take that back to their hive. So it's not good practice, but if you've accidentally left some honey out and some of your hives have found it, then they'll be in a real robbing mood where they're looking for exposed honey. And that's when you can get a lot of bees coming to your jar. As you can see, there's none right now. And often it's like that. Sometimes you get one or two bees, curious, just find it, come for a little lick and fall in the honey. Not really a problem. You can just fish them out, put them back at the front. The bees will clean them up. Now, uh, if you find you've got bees coming around, then you will want to cover your jar. There's easy ways to do that. You can do it with a, with a what's called a honey bee wrap, which is one of those waxy cloths you see us using sometimes. Or you can use some kitchen wrap, or you can use your, um, your veil, which um, has the netting on it. Anything just to stop them 
getting in the top. Or you can get more elaborate and do some plumbing and put a hole in the lid so there's a direct connection from your jar to the hive. Um, Lorraine says that someone told her that the flow hive works the bees to death because they don't stop. Is this true? Okay, flow hive works the bees to death. So when we originally came out, there was such an amazing groundswell about our flow hive, our new invention that allows you to take honey out of the hive, that, that there was also a lot of backlash, which is fair enough. Something big and new came along and upset the apple cart. Now, um, Working the hive to death, I, I would say that it's the actual complete opposite. So the reason why I say that is you can look into the hive and see what the bees are doing, see that they're filling these cells here. You, you'll notice that the pattern here of the honey in the hives changes on a daily basis. You can see this grow and see it shrink. So you can easily tune in with that and know when to harvest or when not to harvest. If they're really hungry, just take one frame or even a part of a frame. So you only need to take enough for your family. Conventional beekeeping, while you're in there because it was such a big effort to, to rob the honey as it was called and take it to the um, processing shed, you would never do it just for part of a frame. You'd never do it for one frame. You'd never even do it for two frames really. You'd always take the whole box of honey and commit your weekend to um, processing that honey. Now, that in my mind is more likely to do what you're saying um, than the flow hive method, which really allows you to see what's going on in the hive and, and tap enough honey for your breakfast. <laughs> um, Chuck's asking, should you use an exterior primer before painting the wood with exterior paint? Okay. Um, Yes, if you're wanting to get your hive to last as long as it can outdoors, then nothing beats a really good exterior house paint and primer. So um, by all means, put that on your roof, put it on the box if you're going for that look. Otherwise, use a, um, an, an oil-based product that is built for outdoors and has some mould resistance to it. Carl's wife is worried about bees and young kids. What is some way she could, he could help ease her mind about having a hive with three kids running around? We live, they live on a quarter of an acre. Okay, so there, um, there's always considerations and please read our safety information that's on the bottom of most of our pages. The, um, it's a bit like dogs would be my answer and it, you'll find you'll get a ferocious one that isn't safe to, to have around um, children and you'll find one that that feels very very calm now um if if you have those concerns by all means go to a bee breeder express them and ask for a, a nice gentle hive and a, the difference between a gentle hive is is you'll see us sometimes opening a box and forgetting to put our put our veil on and a, a ferocious hive, or, or sometimes they get called a cranky hive, you'll open the box and they'll come out and sting you in the face and it's no fun at all. So um, the genetics is the big one that comes into play there. Um, having said that, keeping bees does increase the likelihood of stings. And like, like anything, you want to minimise that by um, getting yourself some bee suits, some veils. For, we do have kids' bee suits. But um, if you keep bees, you're likely to get stung at some stage. So it's about, um, it's about accepting that. And that is a part of beekeeping. Rufus is asking, can you paint the flow hive with varnish? Okay, you can paint the flow hive with varnish and there's a few people putting marine grade varnishes on their hives. To me, I wouldn't do it. Um, reason being is I find that when you paint with varnishes it creates a seal on the outside and stops the hive breathing. You can get some sweating underneath that varnish and a year or two will go by and you'll see this mildew creeping under the varnish and then it's hard to go back from there. 
because you need to take that coat completely off before putting another coat on if it's starting to peel from mildew underneath. So I couldn't recommend putting a varnish on your flow hive. For those that are just tuning in, we're talking about the flow hive seven frame, which is compatible with the 10 frame Langstroth sizing, which is in is popular in Australia, in New Zealand, in Canada, in the USA as a, um, a, a sizing. It allows a couple more frames in the brood box than the comparative um, eight frame size, which is a six frame flow hive because flow frames are a bit wider. So um, it gives you a couple more frames, which does help and beekeepers often prefer that size in the colder regions so the bees have a bit more room to expand in colder regions often the hive expands very quickly because the whole season is compressed into into a few months in the extreme cold areas and uh, all of everything that's going to flower has to flower in that time so you want enough room for your bees to expand and often they've got um got the, the bigger size honey box and even multiple honey supers on their hive in order to to keep up with the bees in that expansion time so um the the uh flow hive seven it's called because it's got seven flow frames is is the bigger size and compatible with the 10 frame langstroth and it it's um popular for those reasons a bit more honey storage to get through the winter which is also another advantage. Can you just recap for anyone who's just joining us now what the new, what the offer is with this new seven frame we have to? So at the moment we have the, um, our brand new seven frame, we've just launched it a, um, a week ago and we have a, a special on at the moment if you want to take advantage of that, that includes the harvesting shelf you can see clipped on here. It includes the uh, the adjustable leg kit which allows you to adjust the height of your hive on each corner and then you've got these beautiful levels that help you get your hive set up nice and level and it also includes a bee veil which is a, a, a nice thing to have if you haven't got one of those in your kit. If you want to take advantage of that we do have the um, we'd, a sale on there is limited numbers and they are quite popular in the uh, USA and Canada at the moment so do jump on if you um, want to take advantage of that. Thank you very much for for uh, all your questions it's always fascinating to hear what questions you're um, you're coming in with also let us know where you are tuning in from on in the comments below it's also interesting to me to know that we have this uh, worldwide audience using our flow hives in places, especially if you're in an extreme place. If you're up in Norway and you've got your flow hives and you're tuned in, let us know. It's fantastic to hear those stories. And by all means, send us your photos. We love getting photos of, of people enjoying our invention, enjoying the, the flow hive and looking into the windows and looking after their bees. So send that in as well. Thank you very much for watching and tune in again next week and we'll be showing you some interesting things about how to look after your brood box.